Hello and welcome. My name is Alan and we are back with more Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. Uh, we, this is meant to be Tuesday's video, but uh, essentially, yeah, we're going to be finishing up the story, the murders at the Rue Morgue that we have been working on. So let's jump into this, shall we? <sighs> Keeping now steadily in minds the points to which I have drawn your attention, that peculiar voice, that unusual agility, and that startling absence of motive in a murder so singularly atrocious as this, let us glance at the butchery itself. Here is a woman strangled to death by manual strength and thrust up a chimney head uh, downward. Ordinary assassins employ no such mode of murder as this. Least of all do they thus dispose of the murdered. In the manner of the thrusting the corpse up the chimney, you will admit that there was something excessively altered, something altogether irreconcilable with our common notions of human action, even when we suppose the actors the most depraved of men. Think, too, how great must have been that strength which could have thrust the body up such an aperture so forcibly that the that the united vigor of several persons was found barely insufficient to drag it down turn now to the other indications of the employment of a, of a vigor most marvelous on the hearth were three thick tresses, very thick tresses, of gray human hair. These had not been torn out by the roots. You are aware of the great force necessary in tearing thus from the head even twenty or thirty hairs together. You saw the locks in question as well as myself. Their roots, a hideous sight were clotted with fragments of the flesh of the scalp. Sure token of the prodigious power which had been exerted in uprooting perhaps half a million of hairs at a time. The throat of the old lady was not merely cut, but the head absolutely severed from the body. The instrument was a mere razor. I wish you also to look at the brutal ferocity of these deeds, of the bruises upon the body of Madame La Espagne, Espagne. I do not speak. Monsieur Dumas and his worthy coadjutor, Monsieur Etienne have pronounced that they were inflicted by some obtuse, in, obtuse instrument. And so far these gentlemen are very correct. The obtuse instrument was clearly the stone pavement in the yard upon which the victim had fallen from the window which looked in upon the bed. This idea, however simple, it may now seem escape the police for the same reason that the breadth of the shutters escaped them, because by the affair of the nails their perceptions had been hermetically sealed against the possibility of the windows having ever been opened at all. If now an addition of all these things you have 
properly reflected upon the odd disorder of the chamber, we have gone so far as to combine the ideas of an agility astounding, a strength superhuman, a ferocity brutal, a butchery without motive, a grotesquerie in horror absolutely alien from humanity, and a voice foreign in tone to the ears of men of many nations, and devoid of all distinct or intelligible syllabification. What result, then, has ensued? What impression have I made upon your fancy? I felt a creeping of the flesh as Dupin asked me the, the question. A madman, I said, has done this deed. Some raving maniac escaping from a neighboring Maison de Sante. In some respects, he replied, your idea is not irrelevant. But the voices of madmen, even in their wildest paroxysms, are never found to tally with that peculiar, peculiar voice heard upon the stairs. Madmen are of some nation, and their language, however incoherent in its words, have always the coherence of syllabification. Besides, the hair of the madman is not such as I now hold in my hand. I disentangled this little tuft from the rigidly clutched fingers of Madame L'Espagne, Tell me what you can make of it. Dupin, I said, completely unnerved. This hair is most unusual. This is no human hair. I have not, ins not asserted that it is, said he. But before we decide this point, I wish you to glance at the little sketch. I have traced upon this paper. It is a facsimile drawing of what has been described in one person of the testimony as dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails upon the throat of Mademoiselle La Espagne and in another by Mon Mon Monsieur Dumas and Etienne as a series of livid spots, evidently the impression of fingers. You will perceive, continued my friend, spreading out the paper upon the table before us, that the drawing gives the idea of a firm and fixed hold. There is no slipping apparent. Each finger has retained, possibly until the death of the victim, the fearful grasp by which it originally embedded itself. Attempt now to place all your fingers at the same time in the respective impressions as you see them. I made the attempt in vain. We are possibly not giving this matter a fair trial, he said. The paper is spread out upon a plain surface, but the human throat is cylindrical. Here is a billet of wood, the circumference of which is about that of the throat. Wrap the drawing around it and try the experiment again. I did so. But the difficulty was even more obvious than before. This, I said, is the mark of no human hand. Read now, replied Dupin, the message from Cuvier. It was a minute anatomical and generally descriptive account of the large fulvus orangurant 
Orang Otang of the East Indian Islands. The gigantic stature, the prodigious strength and activity, the wild ferocity, and the imitative propensities of these mammalia are sufficient, sufficiently well known to all. I understood the full horrors of the murder at once. The description of the digit, said I, as I made an end of reading, is in exact accordance with this drawing. I see that no animal but the orangutan of the species here mentioned could have impressed the indentations as you have traced them. This tuft of tawny hair, too, is identical in character with that of the beast of Cuvier. But I cannot possibly comprehend the particulars of this frightful mystery. Besides, there were two voices heard in contention, and one of them was unquestionably the voice of a Frenchman. True, and you will remember an expression attributed almost unanimously by the evidence to this voice. The expression mon dieu. This, under the circumstances, has been justly characterized by one of the witnesses, Maltani, the confectioner, as an expression of the remonstrance or expostulation. Upon these two words, therefore, I have mainly built my hopes of a full solution of the riddle. A Frenchman was cognizant of the murder. It is possible, indeed it is far more than probable, that he was innocent of all the participants innocent of all participation in the bloody transaction which took place. The orangutan may have escaped from him. He may have traced it to the chamber, but upon the agitating circumstances which ensued, he could never have recaptured it. It is still at large. I will not pursue these guesses for I have no right to call them more. Since the shades of reflection upon which they are based are scarcely of sufficient depth to be appreciable by my own intellect, and since I could not pretend to make them intelligible to the understanding of another, we will call them guesses then and speak of them as such. If the Frenchman in question is indeed, as I suppose, uh, innocent of this atrocity, uh, this advertisement which I last left which I left last night upon our return home at the office of Le Monde a paper devoted to the uh, shipping interest and much sought by sailors will bring them to our residence he handed me uh, a paper and I read thus call in the Bois de la B B Bologna, early in the morning of the in the morning of the murder, a very large tawny orangutan of the Borne species, the owner who is ascertained to be a sailor belonging to the Mal to a Maltese vessel may have the animal again upon identifying it satisfactorily and paying a few charges arising from its capture and keeping. Call it number 
Rue Fallberg Saint Germain à Troisième. How is it possible, I ask, that you should know the man to be a sailor and belonging to a Maltese vessel? I do not know it, said Dupin. I am not sure of it. Here, however, is a small piece of a ribbon, which from its form and from its greasy appearance has evidently been used in tying the hair in one of these long queues of which sailors are so fond. Moreover, this knot is one which few besides sailors can tie and is peculiar to the Maltese. I picked the ribbon up at the foot of the lightning rod. It could not have belonged to either of the deceased. Now, if, after all, I am wrong in my induction from this ribbon that the Frenchman was a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, still, I have done no harm in saying what I did in the ad advertisement. If I am right, a great point is gained. Cognizant, although innocent of the murder, the Frenchman will naturally hesitate about replying to the advertisement, about demanding the orangotang. He will reason thus. I am innocent. I am poor. My orangotang is of great value. To one in my circumstances, a fortune of itself, why should I lose it through idle apprehensions of danger? Here it is within my grasp. It was found in the Bois de la Bologne, Bologna, at a vast distance from the scene of that butchery. How can it ever be suspected that a brute beast should have done the deed. The police here are, uh, the police are at fault. They have failed to procure the slightest clue. Should they even trace the animal, it would be impossible to prove me cognizant of the murder or to implicate me in guilt on account of that cognizance. Above all, I am known. The advertiser designates me as a possessor of the beast. I am not sure to what limit his knowledge may extend. Should I avoid claiming a property of so great value which is which it is known that I possess, I will render the animal at least liable to suspicion. It is not my policy to attract attention either to Mr. Uh, to myself or to the beast. I will answer the advertisement, get the orangotong, and keep it close until the matter is blown over. At this moment we heard a step upon the stairs. Be ready, said Dupin, with your pistols, but neither use them nor show them until a, a signal from myself. The front door of the house had been left open and the visitor had entered without ringing and advanced several steps upon the staircase. Now, however, he seemed to hesitate. Presently, we heard him descending Dupin was moving quickly to the door when we again heard him coming up. He did not turn back a second time, but stepped up with decision and rapped at the door of our chamber. Come in, said Dupin, in a cheerful and hearty tone. A man entered. He was a sailor, evidently, a tall, stout, 
and muscular looking person with a certain daredevil expression of countenance. Not altogether un uh, prepossessing. His face, greatly sunburnt, was more than half hidden by whisker and mustachio. He had with him a huge oaken cudgel, but appeared to be in, to, but appeared to be otherwise unarmed. He bowed awkwardly and bade us good evening in French accents, which, although somewhat neufchatelish, were still sufficiently indicative of a Parisian origin. Sit down, my friend, said Dupin. I suppose you have called about the orangutan. Upon my word, I almost envy you the possession of him. A remarkably fine and no doubt a very valuable animal. How old do you suppose him to be? The sailor drew a long breath with the air of a man relieved of some intolerable burden, and then replied in an, in an assured tone, I have no way of telling, but he can't be more than four or five years old. Have you got him here? Oh, no. We've had no conveniences for keeping him here. He is at a livery stable in the Rue de Bourg, just by. You can get them in the morning. Of course, you are prepared to identify the property. To be sure, I am, sir. I shall be sorry to part with him, said Dupin. I don't mean that you should be all at all this trouble for nothing, sir, said the man. Couldn't expect it. Am very willing to pay a reward for the finding of the animal. That is to say, anything in reason. Well, replied my friend, that is all very fair, to be sure. Let me think. What should I have? Oh, I will tell you. The, you my reward shall be this. You shall give me all the information in your power about these murders in the Rue Morgue. Dupin said the last words in a very low tone and very quietly. Just as quietly, too, he walked towards the door, locked it, and put the key in his pocket. He then drew a pistol from his bosom and placed it without the least flurry upon the table. The sailor's face flushed up as if he were struggling with suffocation. He started to his feet and grasped his cudgel, but the next moment he fell back into his seat, trembling violently and with the countenance of death him itself. He spoke not a word. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart. My friend, said Dupin in a kind tone, you are alarming yourself unnecessarily. You are indeed. We mean you no harm whatever. I pledge you the honor of a gentleman, and of a Frenchman, that we intend you no injury. I perfectly well know that you are innocent of the atrocities in the Rue Morgue. It will not do, however, to deny that you are in some measure implicated in them. From what I have already said, you must know that I have had means of information about this matter, means of which you could never have dreamed. Now, the thing stands thus. You have done nothing which you could have avoided, nothing certainly which renders you culpable. You are not even guilty of robbery, even you might have uh, when you might have robbed with impunity. You have nothing to conceal. You have no reason for concealment. On the other hand, you are bound by every principle of honor to confess all you know. An innocent man is now imprisoned, charged with that crime. 
of which you can point out the perpetrator. The sailor had recovered his presence of mind in a great measure while Dupin uttered these words, but his original boldness of bearing was all gone. So help me God, said he, after a brief pause, I will tell you all I know about this affair, but I do not expect you to believe me, or believe one half I say. I would be a fool, um, indeed, if I did. Still, I am innocent, and I will make certain, make, er, make a clean breast if I die for it. What he stated was, in substance, this. He had lately made a voyage to the Indian archipelago, a party of which he formed one, landed at Borneo and passed into the interior of an excursion of pleasure. Himself and a companion had captured the orangutan, this companion dying the animal fell into his own exclusive possession. After a great trouble, occupied by the intractable ferocity of his captive during, his home, uh, during the home voyage, he at length succeeded in lodging it safely at his own residence in Paris, where, not to attract towards himself the unpleasant curiosity of his neighbors, he kept it carefully secluded until such time as it should recover from a wound in the foot, received from a splinter on board ship. His ultimate design was to sell it. Returning home from the sailor's frolic on the night, or rather in the morning of the murder, he found the beast occupying his own bedroom, into which it had broken from a closet adjoining where it had been, as was thought, securely confined. Razor in hand and fully lathered, it was sitting before a looking-glass attempting the operation of shaving in which it had no doubt previously watched its master through the keyhole of the closet. Terrified at the sight of the danger, uh, at, at, terrified at the sight of so dangerous a weapon in the possession of an animal so ferocious and so well able to use it, the man for some moments was at loss at a loss what to do. He had been accustomed, however, to quiet the creature, even in its fiercest moods, by the use of a whip, and to this he now resorted. Upon sight of it, the orang Otang sprang at once through the door of the chamber, down the stairs, and thence through a window, for unfortunately open, into the street. The Frenchman followed in despair. The ape, razor still in hand, occasionally stopping to look back and gesticulate at its pursuer until the latter had nearly come up with it. In it then again made off. In this manner he the chase continued for a long time. The streets were profoundly quiet, as it was nearly three o'clock in the morning. In passing down the alley in the rear of the Rue Morgue, the fugitive's attention was arrested by a light gleaming from the open window of Madame La Espagne's chamber in the fourth story of her house. Rushing to the building, it perceived the lightning rod, clambered up the incon with inconceivable agility, 
grasped the shutter, which was thrown fully back against the wall, and by its means swung itself directly upon the headboard of the bed. The whole fear they the whole feat did not occupy a minute. The shutter was kicked open again by the orangal tongue as it entered the room. The sailor, in the meantime, was both rejoiced and perplexed. He had strong hopes of now recapturing the brute, as it could scarcely escape from the trap into which it had ventured, except by the rod where it might be intercepted as it came down. On the other hand, there was much cause for anxiety as to what it might do in the house. This latter reflection urged the man still to follow the fugitive. A lightning rod is ascended without difficulty, especially by a sailor, but when he had arrived as high as the window, which lay far to his left, his career was stopped, and the most that he could accomplish was to reach over so as to obtain a glimpse of the interior of the room. At this glimpse, he nearly fell from his hold through excess of horror. Now it was that those hideous shrieks arose upon the night which had startled from slumber the inmates of the Rue Morgue. Madame la, la Espanaye and her daughter, in, uh, habitated in their night clothes, had apparently been occupied in arranging some papers from the iron chest already mentioned, which had been wheeled into the middle of the room. It was open and its contents lay beside it on the floor. The victims must have been sitting with their backs toward the window, and from the time elapsing between ingress of the beast and those screams, it seems probable that it was not immediately perceived. The flapping into the shutter would naturally have been attributed to the wind. As the sailor looked in, the gigantic animal had seized Madame L'Espanaye by the hair, which was loose as she had been combing it, and was flourishing the razor about her face, an imitation of the motions of a barber. The daughter lay prostrate and motionless. She had swooned. The screams and struggles of the old lady, during which her hair was torn from her head, had the effect of changing the probably pacific purposes of the orangutang into those of wrath. With one determined sweep of its muscular arm, it nearly severed her head from her body. The sight of blood inflamed its anger into frenzy, gnashing its teeth and flashing fire from its eyes. It flew upon the body of the girl and embedded its fearful talons in her throat, retaining its grasp until she expired. Its wandering and wild glancing glances fell upon this moment upon the head of the bed, over which the face of its master, rigid with horror, was just discernible. The fury of the beast was no doubt bore still in mind the dreaded whip was instantly converted into fear. Conscience, conscious of having deserved punishment, it seemed desirous of concealing its bloody deeds, and skipped about the chamber in an agony of nervous agitation, throwing down and breaking the furniture as it moved, and dragging the bed from the bedstead. In conclusion, it seized first the corpse of the daughter and thrust it up the chimney as it was found, then that of the old lady, 
which it immediately hurled through the window headlong. As the ape approached the casement with its mutilated burden, the sailor shrank aghast to the rod, and rather gliding than clambering down it, hurried at once home, dreading the consequences of the butchery, and gladly abandoning in his terror all solicitude about the fate of the orangutan. The words heard by the party upon the staircase were the Frenchman's exclamations of horror and of fright, commingled with the fiendish jabberings of the brute. I have scarcely anything to add. The orangutan must have escaped from the chamber by the rod just before the breaking of the door. It must have closed the window as it passed through it. It was subsequently caught by the owner himself who obtained it for uh, who obtained for it a very large sum at the Jardin de Plantes. Le Bon was instantly released upon our narration of the circumstances, with some comments from Dupin at the Bureau of the Prefect of Police. This functionary, however, well disposed to my friend, could not altogether conceal his chagrin at the turn which affairs had taken, and was fain to indulge in a sarcasm or two about the propriety propriety of every person minding his own business. Let him talk, said Dupin, who had not thought it necessary to reply. Let him discourse. Uh, it will ease his conscience. I am satisfied with having defeated him in his own castle. Nevertheless, that he failed in the solution of this mystery is by no means the matter of wonder which he supplies it. For in truth, our friend the prefect is somewhat too cunning to be profound. In his wisdom is no stamen. It is all head and no body, like the pictures of the goddess Laverna or, at best, all head and shoulders like a codfish. But, he is a good creature after all. I, like him, especially for one master stroke of Kant, by which he has attained his reputation for ingenuity. I mean, the way he has de nier se qui est et de expliquer expliquer ce qui n'est pas. But that will end the actual story. Yeah. So we finish off with the actual head detective proving he was actually a little smarter than our one companion. Um. It's a meeting of minds in which their intellect is put to test upon one another. Again, I thought it would be some weird incident, which it was. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. I kind of figured it wouldn't be like this big, huge, normal, gruesome murder. I kind of thought there wouldn't be others involved. It would be something they had done themselves. But apparently, yeah, it, it was just that this beast had become involved and not understanding the use of the razor was practicing on the old lady swiping at her face with the razor in the motions it understood as being what its owner had been doing to shave. And remember, this is this is before safety razors. This is your old school straight razors, you sharpen using the leather straps. So yeah. The, the, the <laughs> these are the kind of razors where you could really do some damage. So yeah. This event where the primate had broken in had caused the daughter to pass out in shock. She, she swooned. You know, it, it was all just too much for her, and so she passes out at the revelations, the event. And so, yeah. Um, the I think they said it was the sight of blood from the old lady sent it into a frenzy so, you know, apes have so much more strength than people. You're greater primates, orangutans, chimpanzees, gorillas. They're going to have a hell of a lot more strength than people do. The human is quite weak. Our adaptation is in other aspects. Squishing a bottle there. You know, you look at gorillas, we have much longer legs. We're able to stand up straight, so we can see further around us than you look at like a chimpanzee. Which is why many of the greater apes still have to live in trees so they can see what's going on around them. They, they can live on the ground just fine. It's just that it's still hard to spot predators. We've got a much better ability to 
to notice these things because when we stand up straight, we can see, we, we get a better height where we can see around and notice things. Where before we couldn't look over the grass, you know, humans developed so that hey, we, we can see You know, and there's other things. The expanded brain case and... Yeah. Uh... But as I was saying, where I kind of travel off course there. Most of your greater eight primates are going to have much higher strength. And if it's holding a straight razor and it swings with just one full strength chop, yeah, it's pretty much going to almost be header. And then it goes over and just throttles the daughter, choking her to death. <laughs> but it's in panic and fear when it sees... Uh, the master because the last thing it wanted to, uh, it knows was the master will whip me and so you know out of panic it takes the daughter and <laughs> just shoves her up the chimney so she's hanging upside down in the chimney Yeah. Anyway, very interesting tell. That is the end of that story, the murders at the Rue Morgue. Poe trying to give us a bit of a twist. Like I said, I, I, I kind of figured there would be one, just the way the story was kind of unfolding, and his character, character-esque for Poe himself, so, yeah. But, we'll go ahead and end this episode here, as always, educate myself, think read study learn someone tells you something you have trouble believing ask them to cite their sources thank you all for watching i'll see you all in the next one until then later